Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of this Let's Learn series for Victoria 3. In this series we will be going through a full game from start to finish while exploring and explaining every single mechanic in detail to see how the decisions we take and the changes we make to our nation actually feed through its economy and its political system. Without further ado, let's go ahead and create a new game, Iron Man Mode Sandbox. And, you know, we will be playing as Serbia, a one state minor power in Eastern Europe that actually starts out as a protectorate of the Ottoman Empire. And it is woefully behind uh, all other European nations in, term, in, in terms of uh, econo its economy and its political system. It is effectively a semi feudal society that has somehow, you know, managed to make it to 1836. Uh, but this is a good thing for this kind of tutorial slash let's learn kind of together series because this slow start will actually make our initial choices quite straightforward and it will help us see how the various game mechanics are interconnected and how does this, uh, you know, how a semi-feudal society actually rises, uh, you know, through the ranks, liberalizes politically and industrializes uh, economically. So let's go ahead and here we are. Serbia, let's get a bit of background before we jump in. So Serbia has fought hard for its independence and will surely have to continue its struggle to retain it. Wedged between great powers, will Serbia become the powder keg of Europe? Well, let's see, it certainly has the potential to do so. And we'll begin guys, yeah, it was, it's gonna take a little bit of time, but we'll do an overview of Serbia, right? But I guess first things first, let's just say, in fact, before I start, let me let me just do a little caveat that, you know, I don't posit that I know everything about the game. I do not, but I have done a couple of playthroughs on this channel before that taught me a lot about the game. And I've done a bit of research on my own, just reading various forums and uh, Victoria Wiki. So I think I have a good grasp now of kind of pretty much all of the mechanics other than a few of the intricate ones. So I will go, you know, as as we go along, I will explain as much as I possibly can and utilize the tooltips and my own knowledge. Not everything's actually explained as I've learned in the tooltips, even though they are pretty expansive in Victoria 3. So if you do have a, you know, if you know, if you spot a, you know, a mistake I'm making or you have a question or any better ideas, just let me know down in the comments. It is possible, although I think not hopefully very likely that, uh, you know, I actually make a mistake in some of the mechanics. But uh, for the most part, I think I have a good grasp. So especially if you're a beginner to Victoria 3 or even sort of an intermediate type player, I think you will learn a lot. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in and just talk a little bit about Serbia. So we, to our north, we got Austria. And to our south, we got the Ottoman Empire. Two great powers, all right? To our east, we have Wallachia, which is effectively kind of the the homeland capital state of Romania, or nascent Romania. And then to our east further down, we have Russia, or the Russian Empire, right? Who is also Orthodox and Slavic, uh, as is Wallachia. So, you know, we have kind of linked that link with them. Austria is itself an empire, a multi-ethnic empire, and they're at least Christian. And the Ottomans are, of course, Muslim. But we do start out as they're a protectorate under the Ottoman Empire. And that effectively means we're not independent. However, we are actually fully autonomous, so we can carry out our own diplomacy, pretty much do anything we like. There is only two sort of restrictions on us. One, which is that if we had a port and we had any convoys, we'd have to contribute 50 of those convoys to the Ottoman Empire, which is not relevant to us. And secondly, is that when the Ottoman Empire subjugated us or made us into their protect protectorate, which is the loosest form of uh, subjugating someone. They've also made us a part of their market, right? And we cannot leave that market. So we can't join a customs union, I believe, with uh, another nation. But that is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it, it will be pretty hard for us uh, and actually detrimental to our economy if we were just our one nation, uh, well, one state nation. So it's actually good to have access to the entirety of the Ottoman Empire, which stretches all the way from Bosnia Right, down to Macedonia, obviously Asia Minor, and all the way down through Mesopotamia here to Basra, right, and Baghdad, so all the way down to through Iraq. Um, so that's actually kind of a good thing. So for now, we don't mind being a protectorate. However, you know, before we begin even with an overview, let's just 
kind of decide on what our general strategic goal will be with this playthrough. Uh, and I think, you know, and, and it's kind of more for immersion and roleplay purposes, probably more than anything else. But effectively, what you can see is that uh, we are part of the Ottoman Empire. So our first goal would be you know, to gain independence. But, uh, you know, to what end, you might ask, but uh, to the end of simply being, uh, you know, in charge of our own affairs. But secondly, probably more importantly, to actually unite the Serbian people, as you will see, uh, we, our state is one of northern Serbia. Southern Serbia is almost fully Serbian. We've got 580,000 Serbs living here. We have Montenegro, where we have another 184,000. Uh, another sort of 34,000 Montenegro. There's also Austrian Montenegro. In Bosnia, we have 372,000 Serbs. And even in the Austrian Empire, we have another 280,000 Serbs. Another 48,000 here. So there are quite a few, sort of one, one two, three or five provinces around us that we consider to be our homeland and that actually have a, you know, a great number of Serbs living. And our goal will be to gain independence and unite the Serb Serbian people and build up uh, no, our own homeland. That is our goal. And to that end, we will direct our economy, our industry, diplomacy and war efforts. With that said, let's go ahead and just do a quick overview of our starting position. So here we are. Serbia, we are a minor power, right? Countries of minor power rank are pawns in the imperialist game of major and great powers who often use them as buffer countries, puppets, or captive markets, right? It gives us a few benefits. We'll talk about that later, but uh, you know, overall, it doesn't restrict us actually too much. We're rank 40 in the world with 16 prestige. Prestige mostly comes, so we have base of 15 from country tier of kingdom and then we have army two from army power projection because we have two but a few battalions here four right um we also get some from navy projection if we had any navy or even access to the sea and there is a few kind of other percentage benefits and there's a few events that can give you some prestige what minor i mean we're basically one prestige away from becoming insignificant power um uh, which is, I think, very likely to happen. Uh, and, uh, sorry, actually, we also get prestige from GDP, I believe. Once we actually start rising, uh, you know, the larger our economies, the more prestige we have. But being a minor power allows us to declare one interest and gives us maybe some other minor benefits. And having declaring a strategic interest in a region allows you to do diplomacy in that region and trade with that region. Now, for now, we can only trade with really the Ottoman Empire and Austria, really. And since we are bordering them, uh, they actually have uh, an inherent interest in the region where we're in, so we don't even need to declare potentially interest anywhere uh, for now. So it's not 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 a big uh, not a big problem for us initially, not not a big concern. So we have four battalions. We'll look at our military later. Now GDP wise, we're two hundred fifty nine thousand, number one hundred ten worldwide. We quickly check the ledger, check the GDP just to give us a sense. All right. So for example, Great King. Great Qing is uh, China, 120 million, right? Let's say for in Great Britain, obviously preeminent power in Europe, 26 million GDP, Russia, 35 million. And where we are, we're in the ranks of Paraguay, slightly above us. Nepal is a little bit above us. But Sierra Leone, uh, right? Bali in Asia is uh, roughly our level, right? Cambodia is kind of some some this few positions below. That's where we are, right? So extremely low. GDP per capita, we're practically at the bottom of the world. We're 0 0.3 per person. So our GDP is relatively small compared to our population. Uh, and our population, we have 809,000 Serbs living in our state. Nin number 98 worldwide. And importantly here, we count our first initial problem is that we are actually uh, losing POPs at a rate of 1.6 thousand per year. We'll have to look why that is and rectify that probably as soon as possible. Our literacy is at 10.7%. Again, number 111 worldwide. We're woefully behind uh, the world. Is that a good or a bad thing? Actually, we will talk about that. Uh, it has literacy has benefits and drawbacks. Uh, now, in terms of our average standard of living, we're at 6.3. So average is struggling. Now, if we actually look at this tooltip, though, we can see that our lower strata is at 5.6 with minimum expected of 5. And this is base kind of coded in the game. 
Uh, so our lowest shot is barely making ends meet. Now, again, I will we'll talk about all the mechanics in more detail after we unpause, but just initially, for your information, guys, the standards of living of one to four means your pops are starving. So five is the absolute minimum, and that's what lower strata demands is just to get by. At least that your population growth is stagnant at this uh, standard of living, and you're basically at least not starving, just surviving, not having any babies. You're just living day, you know, hand to mouth every day. That is what five represents. Okay, and how lower strata is at five point six, on average. Our middle strata is middling at sixteen with minimum expected of 11, and actually base uh, code in the game is actually 10. Uh, it's actually a little bit uh, higher because of literacy. So one thing literacy does is increases your minimum expected standard of living. We'll trace through how exactly that works uh, uh, you know, uh, later on. Our upper strata is prosperous at 27 standard of living versus their minimum expected of 15. Interestingly, literacy is actually having a smaller effect on the upper strata. Well, again, we'll see why that is later. So our middle strata and upper strata are actually doing fine. Our lower strata, which is our sort of peasants, laborers, etc., are barely getting by. So we'll have to take a look on that. Now, otherwise, we have a state religion, and that's orthodoxy. Uh, we have a primary culture, which is Serbian, right? Our government, we are principality type, uh, government type, which means we're basically a hereditary monarchy. Uh, although it's we're more of a duke rather than a king, but they are pretty much hereditary monarchy is what we are. And our government currently is represented by the landowners uh, interest group uh, just by themselves, which holds 52% of political of clout, which is basically means 52.7% of political power in our nation, with political power being derived from how many pops support your interest group and um, what wealth level they are, and a few other modifiers. And we have uh, two modifiers. One is that we have an autocracy law uh, on, and we have... Uh, I believe serfdom or maybe it's peasant levies in our army uh, that actually give another 25%. So whatever strength is uh, landowners have, it's uh, then increased by 75%. Basically landowners, you know, it's a sort of semi-medieval society as I mentioned before. Landowners run the government, right? And these are the owners of great estates and vast plantations. The landowners are custodians of tradition and old money. This is the aristocracy, okay? Uh, together with our king. Diplomacy-wise, we've gone through it. Let's go ahead and just have a look uh, what the relations uh, are towards us on the map and what is the attitude. So relations are the current stance of diplomatic relations between two countries. Both sides can influence this. Right? In fact, we want pretty sure damage relations, so it's improved relations. So let's have a look. So Ottoman Empire, uh, our relations with the Ottoman Empire are poor. Our relationship relations with Austria are poor. Relations with Wallachia are cordial and our relations with Russia are cordial. Okay, so that's something to know. And we can show the attitude, and the attitude is a little bit different. It's an indication of how another country feels about you based on the relations, how it, and that's kind of their attitude towards us, uh, or sort of their relations with us, or relations between us. Our infamy, that's whether we've done something, you know, perhaps nefarious in the past, but we're reputable. So that's good. Strategic desire, so their own strategic goals and factors, such as how large your military is and which countries you have diplomatic pacts with. Attitude affects what sorts of actions a country is likely to take towards you and what role you play in their plans. Right? So, for example, Austria is views Serbia as an unknown factor in geopolitical affairs. They consider Serbia relevant to their interests, but has not yet decided whether they seem as a friend or an enemy. Right? Ottoman Empire it views Serbia as in need of their protection in geopolitical affairs. They are likely to intervene on our side in diplomatic place and may offer Serbia to become their subject. Okay, we don't want to be a subject, we want to be independent. But these three do have this sort of un unwanted ally, you could say. Now, Wallachia also sees Serbia as an unknown factor, just like Austria. And so does Russia. In fact, interestingly, this actually changes every time you load the game. I think there is some randomization. So people don't really know. Russia, Wallachia, and Austria think we're an unknown factor. Ottoman Empire thinks we're in need of their protection. And we'll see. Before we unpause, we'll think about diplomacy. Uh, this is uh, the last tab. We won't go over the whole thing right now. But this is actually a tab that I found myself consulting quite often. So this is under, if you just click on your empire, and then at uh, at the end, third tab is modifiers. It lists all the modifiers 
uh, of your country and it is sometimes useful to find if you don't understand the tooltip uh, sometimes it's useful to find that modifier here and it kind of explains uh, you, know, you know kind of that that mechanic but for example as I mentioned just now so we do um, landowners political strength so whoever how many people support landowners what wealth they have is that uh, you know that determines their clout or percentage of total political power in our nation it always ends up it adds up to a hundred percent is multiplied them by 75 and this is peasant levies and serve them right so those two laws make landowners much more powerful right because they basically run the peasants and the peasants are in the army so they tell the peasants what to do so they actually are super powerful where we will see peasants have practically no power uh so that's serbia right as a sort of a nation quick overview now let's go ahead and have a look at sort of our one state right of northern serbia Okay, interestingly, GDP is 503,000. That's just a, uh, a glitch, I think. We just need to start the game and it will adjust. Ottoman M uh, access, um, market access is 100%. That means we are below our infrastructure cap. And we'll talk about this uh, later, but that's all good. Population we've seen, we're struggling. It's a capital state. And being a capital state means um, we have plus 25% infrastructure bonus. It also means, in fact, that we get uh yep we also get 25 percent political strength to all pops living in capital state and we have 25 percent taxation capacity bonus all right so. um then we are homelands of the serbian culture and not other culture that will uh, have an effect on migration and a few other things we have a modifier here that of the Danube River flowing through northern Serbia, and that gives us plus five percent market price, uh, market access price impact, which again we'll talk about later, and it gives us twenty infrastructure. So very nice. So we're actually in a pretty good starting position. Uh, some good bonuses. You know, only Serbian. We are only uh, Orthodox. We have plenty of infrastructure, plenty of taxation capacity. We're good. Now let's have a look kind of at our economy. And um, where do we start? So we have here no urban buildings, no resources, although we do have potential for logging camps and iron mines. All right? And that depends just, uh, you know, it depends on the state in, in both which resources are even available. Right, So we do have iron as a natural resource in, this, in our state and we do have forests uh, in our state. The size, the potential size of the industry is independent, again, varies between state to state. So we have quite a bit of iron. We have some forests, so we can build up to... You know, level 13 logging camps and level 24 iron mines. Okay, not won't be a concern for the early game, but something to note. Now, in terms of agriculture, we have sort of 32 plus 3, so that means 35 arable land. Again, it varies from state to state depending on you know how much arable land does that kind of area in the world actually have. We have three of the arable land occupied by three agricultural buildings, which are livestock ranches, which uh, take in grain and produce meat and fabric. We have vineyards that uh, just simply pay uh, wages to some people and produce wine. And we have wheat farms that, again, just pay wages to some uh, you know, laborers. Here we can see laborers, farmers, clergymen, aristocrats, and produces some grain. And we also have uh, kind of development buildings. These are government-run buildings, basically. Um, and we have four barracks, which house two battalions of line infantry, uh, one battalion of hussars, and one battalion of mobile artillery. Okay. And they pay them wages, they buy small arms, artillery for our artillery, and some grain to feed the troops, and they provide us four battalions, some training rates as to how quickly, you know, if we were to build one more, how many people uh, they effectively kind of employ or train up to be soldiers and provide some urbanization. Again, we'll talk about all of this in more detail when we are on pause. So this is you know, our economy, right? Livestock ranches, vineyards, and wheat farms, and subsistence farms. So let's talk about subsistence farms, which is a sort of special building uh, that will not be relevant for very long. But, and to be honest, most European nations probably don't even have a lot of that to begin with. But given how backward we are, we do. We have plenty of them, right? So let's see. This is a subsistence building, which is a highly inefficient building that appears when there is unused arable land in a state. As soon as you start exploiting 
the potential it is using, this building will automatically get downsized. So here we have, it employs 160,000 um, peasants, right? 160 or 150,000 peasants, some clergymen and, and some aristocrats, right? 150,000 peasants. Uh, and we'll see in a bit that that actually represents 600,000 of our population because most pops have about three dependents uh, uh, to one working adult. So about three quarters, 75% of our population works on these subsistence farms. And all together they produce, right, they get some wages, but they also produce some wheat, kind of clothes, just a, an assortment of things that people would just need to survive. Some, uh, some furniture, some services, some liquor, some wood, right? So they just run kind of a not typical farm Right, mostly wheat, but uh, yeah, fabric. They make some things with their hands. You know, no tools. So imagine that kind of subsistence level, medieval type existence. All right, that is our economy. Right, and that is why our GDP is two hundred sixty thousand. Now, let's go and look at our population. Population tab will actually give us an overview of who lives in northern Serbia and therefore the whole nation of Serbia, given we're one state nation. And here we are again, 809,000. Our population is declining 0. Point, at 0. Point, rate of 0. 0.2. We have 23.3 thousand unemployed and we have 152,000 peasants. So we have 23,000 people that are actually not even working. So no wonder our GDP is small and our pop growth is declining. Uh, again, this sort of summary of struggling. Again, from this, we can see it's really our lower strata. That's a bit of an issue, quite a bit of an issue. That's basically just barely getting by. Uh, you can see in terms of population, we're 100% Serbian, 100% Orthodox. So no one is discriminated against. It's pretty easy setup to begin with, right? And that's why I, you know, I, 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 that's why I decided to do this series, you know, starting with Serbia. So we isolate, uh, you know, well, we do away with as much complexity as possible and keep this as simple as possible. Uh, and we'll see. I don't think you'll ever see, you know, a simpler list of pops as as this. In Europe, I think for sure. In terms of professions, like I said, we have 75% of our nation are peasants. This number is 608,000, again, because workforce is 25% and dependents are 75. Right? And this is typical for all pops, except uh, aristocrats, I think, that actually have 20% workforce and 80% dependents. Right? So we see laborers, again, we have 143,000, of which 35,000 are workers, of which 23, about 23,000 is unemployed. We have clergymen, 20,000 clergymen live in our nation, uh, 15,000 servicemen, i.e. soldiers. We have 14,000 aristocrats uh, and we have 6.8 thousand farmers, which are not actually the same as peasants. These are actually middle strata. These are actually people who kind of work on, uh, you know, kind of kind of like farm managers. You could call them that, right? Because on a tip, even on a even on something like a wheat farm, all right, if we look at workforce, it's actually laborers that work on it and farmers, right? That you can see here, they're part of the middle strata and we'll read about each pop in a second, right? But, uh, you know, they kind of run the farms, right? So let's go back to our population. This is who we are. And just for comparison, let's have a quick look here. So peasants, their political strength, you see that it says 75% of our nation, 600,000 people, their political strength is 10%. Right, 50,000, 10% of political strength they represent, 75% of population. Laborers are another right, sort of 17.6% of our nation, and it's 1.73% of our of the political strength. Right? So together, these guys are 750,000 of our population, right? So that's so that's 85 plus 7, that's 92% of our population collectively represents about sort of 52,000 of political power or 11% of political power. So 90% of political power, it rests with the, the other groups, right? Which are clergymen, servicemen, aristocrats, and farmers. Now you can see all of these have practically no political power, right? Uh, until we arrive at aristocrats, which are only 14,000 people, and yet they hold a whopping 69% of political power, politi uh, political strength in our nation. We can quickly have a look here the degree of power so political strength is the degree of power a pop and consequently its interest groups the interest groups it supports have over the country's politics it is derived from its supporting pops as wealth uh pops who live in unincorporated states okay that doesn't matter for us basically states that are colonized 
uh, pops distribute their political strength to the interest groups it supports proportionate to how many of its members support it, right? If an interest group is a member of a party, okay, that will that comes in later. There's also votes and etc. But for now, the right we have no votes. So what the, this political strength that they generate, which is 315,000, right? We can see, for example, if we go down here and we go on aristocrats, uh, this actually breaks down the pops. But for example, well, actually, we can see a summary here. Right? So first of all, who are they? These are wealthy landowners, old money and old connections. As owners of farms and plantations, they contribute some of their profits to the investment pool. We'll talk about that in a bit. Their political interests are represented as the landowners, right? So that's their primary interest group. Right? Aristocrats are part of the upper strata, along with capitalists, right? And they're the only two pop, ty pop types that represent the upper strata. Now, aristocrats in Serbia, again, there's 14,000 of them. 2.8 thousand actually work. 11.2 thousand are dependents. And that's 80% of the population. And the aristocrat interest group, aristocrats interest group support in Serbia is split as follows, right? So uh, land, they support landowners, half of them, basically. Then 27% support armed forces, 15% support intelligentsia, 5% 5.6% support off the search. So not all aristocrats support landowners. And the way this is distributed is based on some in-game base values. We'll talk about those again just later on down the line. But uh, yeah, and this sort of the game kind of determines what is the primary kind of and then secondary and tertiary support groups which can also be affected by, for example, the popularity of the leader that is leading that interest group. And we can also, depending on our laws, uh, bolster or suppress interest, uh, interest groups, which would mean, for example, if we suppress landowners, then even aristocrats would kind of shun landowners and gradually shift their uh, political strength and kind of support to their other preferred groups, which would be armed forces, intelligentsia, and orthodox church. If we promoted landowners, actually, it would kind of suck in more of the support uh, towards landowners. Not by a huge amount, but by some amount. So we can sort of direct um, direct some of that. You know, where does that political strength flow in the end? And so, yeah, I guess this is a kind of overview. This is in terms of clout, uh, right? So landowners have 30% of clout. Um uh, that landowners have. Now, this is kind of by population, right? But in, the reality is it, when they're actually kind of in government, it's actually has 52.7 because it's increased by uh, sort of 75%, I believe. Uh, you know, there's that sort of additional on top modifier, right? Similar with Orthodox Church, for example, that's 13, but it's actually increased because we have plus 30% again from, uh, from, state, uh, from state religion. Right, and that's if we click here again. This is why this screen is quite interesting. So you see state religion plus 30% to political strength of the Orthodox Church. Uh, but, oh, sorry. Excuse me. So let's go back to our population. And here we are. I think when we unpause, we'll actually have a look as to who these people are. Uh, but for now, all that we need to know is that we have peasants, laborers as lower strata, as well as servicemen are lower strata. We have clergymen. We have farmers and officers as our middle strata and we have aristocrats as our upper strata, right? Uh, so that is kind of our population. Again, we'll go over my detail, but I do want to just go ahead and unpause. But let's think, let's kind of think uh, through kind of the game loop, you could say, or like the, the thinking that we should go through as we actually think about okay, what do we do before we unpause? But we are Serbia. We're under the rule of Ottoman Empire. We want to gain independence from the Ottoman Empire and we want to unite the Serbian people. Right? That's our goal. In order to take the Ottoman Empire on, right? Now let's have a look. Just a cursory view of the Ottoman Empire. 160 battalions, right? Uh, we have four battalions, right? So I doubt they're going to give us southern Serbia, Montenegro and Bosnia for free. Right? And later on, we're going to need to get Delvidek and Slavonia from Austria. They're not going to give this up Right? We're going to have to fight them for it, most likely. Right? We have four battalions, they have 160 battalions. So we need to build up our armed forces. Right? Now, in order in order to build up an army... Uh, excuse me. Sorry. What do we need? We need enough population so we can actually uh, you know, recruit enough soldiers. We need to pay them wages out of our government budget. And we need to buy goods out of government budgets. So th these goods need to be produced... 
right? And preferably produced within our market, or at least with a market we can trade, because if we buy these goods from the Ottoman Empire, which we are now, since we're not producing anything, right? we're not producing small arms ourselves, right? Northern Serbia, zero production, two consumption. Ottoman market, however, produces 123 and only buys 51 itself, right? So it's pretty, pretty cheap in the Ottoman market. If we were to uh, right, start a play for independence and secede from the Ottoman Empire when the war starts, we wouldn't have any small arms, we wouldn't have any artillery, uh, right? That also zero production. We do produce some grain locally, so that's at least good. So we need to build up our own arms industry, uh, first of all, right? But then also make sure we have the budget to pay our soldiers and buy enough uh, enough of small arms and artillery to actually equip our army and have a chance of gaining independence and reuniting the Serbian people. The way you know we increase our budget surplus is by increasing our taxes, right? Now let's have a look super quick here. Uh, for now, our national revenue country is plus 3,000. That comes from income taxes. Uh, and that's basically any a tax collected on the wages paid to the workforce. So the more people we have employed, gainfully employed with high wages, the more tax we'll have. We have poll taxes, which is a flat tax collected on every working adult it applies to. Since poll taxes do not scale with the pop's income, it tends to impact lower strata the most. So this is 0 0.7 pounds per person. So the, big, the, the bigger the population in our nation, the more poll tax we have. And you can see right now, there isn't a lot of income going around right, among our pops. But there, we do have 800,000 pops and each one pays 0 0.7. So that is 2,000. That's two thirds of our national income. So if we increase our population, uh, we will increase our national budget. Tariffs, that's from trade. Uh, again, so we could produce more goods, actually send them overseas. That would help with the income taxes as well because our buildings would produce more at a, or at a higher price, right? Um, than they would if they weren't exporting. So it kind of creates extra demand. So would you know they, that building would be more uh, productive, pay a high wage, which we would tax. But tariffs, we would also collect some tariffs the more we export. Again, that's kind of not a great option for us because we're landlocked by the Ottoman Empire. So even if we did uh, export somewhere, as soon as we start fighting with the Ottoman Empire, uh, right, we're certainly not going to be exporting from any of the Ottomans' uh, ports. Uh, so actually, we can even go here, here to this budget screen just to have a, the numbers you know, a little bit larger. So there's our national income, as we talked about, income income taxes, poll taxes, tariffs. And we have minting. Minting, I see at 500, we get base. And then 259.91, which equals exactly our GDP, uh, we get from you know, our domestic, gross domestic product. This is effectively, I believe, although I haven't actually checked this yet, but at this time, all... Uh, countries were probably following the gold standard and what that means effectively is as your GDP grows you can inject more money into the economy in fact you should inject more principally print more money because otherwise uh, you know if you had sort of a hundred pounds worth of currency in your economy and the economy was growing you would get deflation i.e every pound would buy more and more and that's not a good thing conversely if you printed too much money as I'm sure you've all heard in the news these days right if you printed too much money uh, then you would get inflation and that's bad because that means every one pound or dollar of your currency actually buys less and that means it's basically worth more. We still right, we still say $100 today, there was also $100 20 years ago, but what they bought for you, right, you can think about they bought you like two McDonald's meals maybe uh, 20 years ago, now they buy you one McDonald's meal, right? And that means it's the number is the same, $100, $100, what it buys is different and, you know, and that's inflation. I so said in the game, it's represented as, okay, we 500 sort of base for everybody. And then the larger our GDP, the more we can mint, I, the more money we can print, the more, you know, the, and then that gives us some revenue, some revenue for national revenue. So we need to uh, grow our industry, right? So we, so we can get more taxes, basically. And we need to grow our population. And that will increase our national revenue versus maintain, keep our expenses low so that later on we can hire soldiers, uh, right? So right now we have for example, for our expenses, let's quickly have a look at that. Uh, we don't have any government wages. We're not even running. Uh, there's no kind of local bureaucrats that we have to pay for. We do have a government, but we don't have any government buildings. Uh, so we don't buy any goods for those buildings. But military wages, we do pay 280 already for the two battalion, for the four battalions we have, sorry. And we do spend 160 on barracks. So already our military costs us 444 
1,000, uh, I guess, right? Or 444. So that's, uh, what, a... 3 divided by... So it's about, what, 6. A sixth of our budget goes our military. And that is our only expenditure. But that's 4 battalions, right? So we could probably build ourselves up to... Uh, Right, so 20 battalions, and that's it. That's all we could do right now. Or probably even less than that, as prices would go up, as we would put more demand on small arms, etc. Um, so that is kind of our goal, right? In raise our population, raise the productivity of our economy, so we can get uh, more money in our budget, and build up our military, and you know make our play for independence and reunification, or the unification uh, of the Serbian people. Now, to that end, right, let's have a look how, and priority number one, perhaps, actually, let's talk about this. If we want to increase our uh, budget surplus, we need more poll taxes. Poll taxes means uh, increasing our population. Population is currently falling. Why is it falling? Now, the reason it's falling is because if we look at our population tab, we look at our laborers here. We can see 93,000 are unemployed. Let's click over and then see who the laborers are. Let's get to know them. They're, these are guys that day laborers, farmhands, and other and others with little to no employment security, performing whatever works is available throughout society. They're usually not engaged in politics, but may get involved through trade unions. Right? So these guys are unemployed, and that means their standard of living is one. Right? It means they're starving. And that means for this particular pop, the pop growth rate. Is currently negative 2.6 percent so they are dying out right they have nothing to eat they have no job remember this is 1836 there is no welfare payments uh we don't have those laws on obviously so you know they have nothing they have nothing and they're in dire need of employment so that they can actually feed themselves and their families um now quickly let's talk about population growth rate and how it works while we're here so Population growth changes with the standard of living. And actually, starting from you know, at, at level 5, right, at, at 5, and why I said that's kind of the minimum base for lower strata, and generally at level 5, it uh, population growth would equal 0. The reason it would be equal 0 is because birth rate would equal mortality rate. As standard of living increases, let's say to 10, birth rate actually drops. Right, because the richer you are, the generally the fewer children you have, right? Kind of you probably focus on kind of just one kid, one or two kids, so to speak, right? And try to give them the best, right? So it actually declines all the way up to the standard of living of 20. Now, however, mortality also declines in the game per per standard of living, and it declines faster than birth rate. So the differential, which is really what's important, uh, actually rises, right? So if we have a look, for example, quickly. Or at uh, uh, even say who is well off, right? Servicemen, lower strata, also just like laborers, but they're better off, right? And here we are. Their standard of living is impoverished 10, and that means they have a differential 1.1. Why? Because births are 5.1 and deaths are 4%, right? So mortality has declined as they've gone up the standard of living, and birth rate also declined as they've gone up standard of living. So they're at 5.1. For example, right? Whereas we take laborers that are actually employed. Um, sorry, for these guys, it's actually 5.3, but there's other modifiers here. Uh, so this is a bit tricky. I can't compare it. And we'll talk about what other modifiers there are. But if we did find servicemen, for example, of uh, similar literacy, the birth rate would be lower at a lower standard of living. So there we are. We're unemployed. Um, and also, so another thing, so at level 5, your 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 population growth rate is stagnant. Below 5, like I said, we're starving, right? For pretty dire circumstances, your mortality rate exceeds your birth rate, right? It's like here. So that's why they're dying out, and that's why, you know, they're dying out at the rate of 2.6%, right? Because there's 100,000 of them, right? There's about 100,000, so an eighth... Of our population 12 and a half of our population is dying out right so no wonder that overall that average is out to 0.2 percent for the entire population so our priority number one is we need to employ these people as fast as possible now while we're just just to finish our conversation about birth rates you know another thing that affects birth rate 
as you would have seen here. And why, for example, now when I compared servicemen to laborers, so you will see there's an impact of literacy. It's basically a tenth of literacy here. So literacy is 12% uh, for these laborers. And that puts a, uh, a damper on uh, birth rate, right? The kind of smarter you are, again, probably the less procreate. I don't know, maybe it's just uh, sexual education is more widespread. But there you are. Literacy, for example. Again, if we look at uh, clergy, which is an interesting... Uh, so clergymen, for example, that work on subsistence farms and are actually really well off. They're middling 18, one of our richest groups, middle strata. You will see their literacy is actually 77%. And this is, uh, again, we'll talk about each individual pop uh, specifically later, but they actually have a base, uh, regardless of what your country is and how much education there is, they have a base literacy of 50% off the bat so they're very illiterate and that means you see their standard living is 18 but their birth rate is 3.1 you're much lower than servicemen right well that was i think 5.3 or so at 10 so 3.1 their effect from literacy is minus 7.7 .7, right but the differential is actually all right it's 1.3 percent that is because at 18 of standard living that mortality has declined even faster than uh, birth rate so it's really the differential that actually matters. So there we are. And that will kind of determine our first priority. Build up some buildings, right? The way we give people jobs is we build a building that can actually employ them, right? Because right now subsistence farms are full. Laborers can't go into subsistence farms, I guess. Uh, so we need to build buildings to provide our laborers with some employment. That will employ them. Uh, stop them from starving, start increasing our population, which is great. Uh, or at least, you know, stop the decline, right? So to that end, I guess we got to think, what building do we build? Let's have a look, right? We have these farms, so we could build up more farms, more wheat, right? Pay these laborers a wage, and they would produce us some grain. But we don't really need any more grain, and you can see, again, we'll go over the tooltips in detail as we play, but right now the base price is kind of minus 8%. Uh, building is profitable, so it's good. It's not super profitable. So building another wheat farm, it might employ even these people, but ultimately everyone will be worse off because we'll be dumping too much grain into the market. Price will go down. The weekly balance will go down. Wages will go down. So that's not a good option. Our vineyards are already weekly balance negative. Uh, so no, we're not going to build more vineyards. Nobody really wants more wine. In fact, we can just go ahead on wine we can see we're producing 20 and consumption in northern serbia is just one we'll see if we, there's anything we can do about that but for now no it's livestock ranches maybe okay also negative i think this will actually change once we unpause but again meat 35 percent below base price fabric 35 percent below it does take grain so if we did build more more livestock ranches then we would consume more grain helping our wheat farm grain farms but uh you know, if they were able to sell this meat and fabric somewhere and actually turn a profit. So we need to build something that is profitable. Now, what could be profitable? We have logging camps, iron mines. Those are our choice for resources. We have urban center. We have a bunch of manufacturing buildings. But anything we take, like textile mills, that would be a good idea, right? We'll produce clothes. But these, uh, well, perhaps these need fabric. Like, are we producing enough fabric? Right? Paper mills would need wood. Uh, tooling workshops need wood. So a lot of things need wood. So why don't we go ahead and look at these uh, logging camps. Oh, sorry. Logging camps. And we can see here, it will say predicted earnings is plus 3.5. It's not always accurate, but at least it's green. So it is positive and it will produce some wood, employ some people. Uh, shouldn't take too long to build. So it's 200 construction. That's another consideration, right? We need to build things quickly right now. So whereas building any of the manufacturing industries is 600, all right? So let's go ahead and build one logging camp, right? So that we actually have wood. Um, and we will wait and we'll, uh, I guess, deal with the rest of the building queue in a bit. So that will be a good idea. That will start employing people, fixing our uh, population growth rate. So that's kind of it for the economy, right? For, the, for, st for starters, right? Uh, now... Let's have a look at our politics. Now, effectively, right, the game of Victoria 3 is about, I'd say, politics and economics. Within economics, you have your internal market and kind of external, that will be trading, 
uh, trade and internal market. In terms of diplomacy, or sort of politics, sorry, you have your internal politics and you have diplomacy is how you interact with the rest of the world. And those are the two or four, you could say, game loops. You could also say a third branch of politics would be warfare, as that's kind of diplomacy by either means, other means, but defending yourself and fighting is a result of diplomacy. So let's have a look at our domestic policy politics. And again, we'll skip over this screen. It's not particularly useful for us right now. Anyway, we'll go to our government. And again, as we talked, here's a summary card. We're a principality. We have Prince Milos Obrenovich ruling our country. This guy who's an heir apparent is Milan Obrenovich. We'll talk about all of that. Our government consists of just a single group of landowners who hold 53% clout because aristocrats support them and aristocrats hold pretty much all the political power in our nation, or 70% of it. Uh, we have a righteous government. Okay, we'll talk why, but that basically for now, uh, before we unpause, all we need to know is that, uh, right, that's good. It gives us a few benefits. And uh, the reason for that is that we are, we are an autocracy. And that means when we include, um, so for example, here, excuse me. So when we include head of state's interest group, landowners is in government. That gives us 50 legitimacy, right? So if the king is, supports landowners, that means if landowners are in power, they're legitimate. And then we have total clout of government is 63. Where does that come from? 52.7% of political power in our nation supporting landowners, which is because aristocrats are wealthy and they support landowners, right? And that's multiplied by 120 because we are, form of government is autocracy. So kind of giving us an even bigger boost, right? So giving us 63. So overall right now we're at 113 uh, legitimacy. So well over 100. Um, now, we have interest groups in government and we have interest group in opposition right and we have sort of orthodox church here armed forces intelligentsia which hold that holds some clout because some pops support them and then we have sort of marginalized groups we'll talk about the differences uh but basically have either no clout because there isn't a single pop that supports them or there is less than five percent of uh, political strength that supports them so they have less than five percent clout that means they're marginalized basically kind of irrelevant um but we have these groups that are in opposition for now that doesn't kind of have much effect. Um, again, we'll talk about why these guys are unhappy again once we unpause. But just to kind of expedite things, let's go to our laws. Let's have a think, you know, what can we do to um, tackle our demographic crisis, right? Now, obviously, healthcare would be one answer, right? And I'm going to kind of short circuit the discussion here and not go over all the laws. But one thing that would be good is right increase or improve healthcare access in our in our nation and that would obviously increase uh well it would decrease mortality right but right now if we look at uh, our health system laws we have no health system this government does not fund any system of healthcare um that's not great but what are our options our options are charity hospitals private health insurance and public health insurance that's for the whole game now private health insurance we will see kind of tooltip what benefits it gives, but there is a requirement here that it needs pharmaceuticals. It needs a tech, which we don't have. Public health insurance, likewise, needs pharmaceuticals. So we don't have that tech. Now, charity hospitals, we could, in fact, enact. It is not currently part of our laws. It will enable the health system institution. Uh, we'll see what institutions are. They're effectively, kind of, uh, institution provides kind of benefits uh, that provides our nation. But effectively, it will enable some form of healthcare in our nation, right? Charity hospitals would provide health system level one with the following. It would give plus 10%, uh, a further 10% bonus to Orthodox Church political strength, right? So whoever supports it, simply we gets a 10% political strength bonus. It will give plus half a percent of standard living to the lower strata, which is great, right? So that will raise the standard of living for our lower strata, improving birth rate further because, well, birth rate will decline. Again, mortality will decline even further with every standard of living. So that will improve uh, our population growth rate. Pollution effects don't really matter right now since we don't have a lower industry. It would also decrease mortality by itself, just from the institution by 3%. So that's great. Uh, and we, so let's say we want to pass this law to increase our population growth. Now, we have one interest group that supports this law, obviously, and that is the Orthodox Church. However, we cannot click it, right? The reason we cannot actually click to try and enact this law 
is because it says the chance that charity hospitals can be enacted must be above 0% through support from either interest group in government, a political movement, or ruler's ideology. Right? A ruler doesn't have, uh, we'll talk about what ideologies are, ruler doesn't have that ideology that, that, that really wants, so the ruler kind of doesn't really care whether we have healthcare of any kind or not, and definitely doesn't care about charity hospitals in particular. Now, we need an interest group in government because if we can see here, right, it's grayed out, but we do actually, in our nation, there is 16.7% of political clout that supports charity hospitals. It is there. And 83, pretty much the rest of the political clout, just doesn't care. No one opposes it, but nobody cares. But Catholic, uh, sorry, oh, Catholic, excuse me, sorry, blasphemy, uh, Orthodox Church does support it. Now, the reason we can't click on it is because it is not, if you go here, it is not in government. Now, let's go ahead, down the bottom, we can reform the government, and we can bring in Orthodox Church. Uh, let's go ahead, bring it, the Orthodox Church in. Now, this does actually change the legitimacy of our government, right? Uh, however, it actually stays at 100. Why is that? Well, that's because, again, we have 50 from head of state uh, being part of landowners. And then we have clout. Now, we have more clout in government, and that's multiplied by 120. So it's 83. So we now actually have 133 legitimacy positive, right? From having two of these uh, interest groups in government, right? So in the tent uh, with the king kind of talking, uh, you know, where to take this nation. However, we also get penalties now. Government ideology penalty is minus eight. And that is distribution of power, landed voting. That's because uh, basically the difference in what these... Uh, what the Orthodox Church wants, right? For example, they, I guess, actually they do endorse autocracy, for example. Uh, interesting. Okay, well, we'll see why this is, but there is basically some discrepancy between what the interest groups in our government support and what laws we have enacted. Some people, so for some reason, someone, God, come on. Someone doesn't or wants landed voting. Interest groups 10, landowners 10. So Orthodox Church does not like doesn't like the fact that we don't have landed landed uh, landed voting, I guess. But in size of government, we get a penalty of minus 20. That's because we're running autocracy. Uh, uh, and that means our base government size is one. So we're really used to just having one interest group in government. Okay, everyone knows who's in charge. Everything is clear and simple for the peasants and everyone else to understand. Now we have two people having to work together, probably find some compromise. Now there's a bit of tension here. So that reduces legitimacy. But overall, overall, we're well above 100. And so we remain a righteous government. So it doesn't really change anything for us. But you know, behind the scenes, it actually does. But because... There's so much cloud between these two groups. We're a righteous government. So let's go ahead and confirm. And now, if we go to our laws, we now do have an interest group in government that supports charity hospitals, which is the Orthodox Church. So we can now enact it. Right? Go ahead and we will enact this to unlock the health institution, which will improve birth rate by improving the standard of living and reduce mortality and help us with our population problem. Right? Now we're enacting charity hospitals. We'll talk about what the success chance means. For now, at a very basic level, it is a chance that these three phases of law adoption, which is right now are called uh, because of you know the way our political system works, they have different names, but right now they're called introduction. So the interest groups introduce the law, then it gets consideration, consider it. Some you know I guess the government considers it, and then they work to adopt the law and implement it. Right? Three stages. We have 16% chance. That, as you can see, sorry, see here, in 50 days. So every 50 days, there will be a check of what happens in this uh, legislative process, right? And there's a 16% chance they will go to consideration, and there's another, we need, and then we need to hit that chance, right? Then there's another 16% chance it goes to adoption, and then it's 16% chance it actually gets enacted, right? Pretty low to start with. That's because we only have one interest group supporting it, and it only has 16.6% .6 cloud. If we were passing something that landowners wanted right now, right? For example, let's just do a quick example. Oh, no, actually, they don't want censorship. 
But if we were, there's nothing else. Ah, oh, okay, so we started this, but for example, no, actually, this is a good example. If we did, if we were to pass censorship right now, which landowners endorse. So if we want, if we want working on passing chari uh, charitable hospitals, right? So what are they called? Charity hospitals. We could pass censorship and that would have uh, 50, uh, well, in fact, that will have 69% chance to progress at every stage because both landowners and Orthodox Church support it, right? That's a lot of clout that wants censorship, right? In fact, they'll probably ask for it once we pass this law uh, because they have so much support for it. But right now it's 16%, so it might take a while. Uh, again, so we'll leave that there and we'll talk a bit more about what laws, you know, how they work and how this process works. Now, before we unpause, we still have to decide on our research. So let's go ahead and kind of think, what do we want? There's a few production techs that we want. So we might want to improve our industry. Now we don't actually have any industry and we don't really know where it's going to go other than, you know, logging camps for now. So we'll leave that alone. In terms of military, uh, yes, it would be nice to start progressing, maybe getting better military. We'll have a look at that uh, again uh, once we unpause. But to be honest, we can't actually afford a military. So these aren't particularly useful right now go to society here we do have you have kind of economics um uh, um text and we have sort of like more like society kind of researchy text now i won't go over all of these straight away right now except i will just say okay how about we have a look at pharmaceuticals because that it will take seven years to research quite a long time but it will give us plus one max health system institution. So hopefully once we do unlock charity hospitals as an institution, we'll be able to then even move it up to level two, which will give us, which will double the benefits of the first level, right? So let's go ahead and click that and just read the background to this. Pardon. All right, click it. The discovery of pharmaceuticals allows for medicine to jump ahead as they can be prescribed for all types of ailments. So discovery of pharmaceuticals allows for medicine to jump ahead as they, they, the pharmaceuticals, can be prescribed for all types of ailments, right? So we unlock pharmaceuticals, get even better healthcare once we actually pass that institution and actually introduce some sort of, some form of healthcare. Uh, and, in, and we will introduce it in the form of charity hospitals to our nation. So there we are. So that's our research. We're researching that, uh, pharmaceuticals. We're building logging camps. And together that will reduce unemployment, right? Reduce unemployment, make our nation, right? Actually start, employ these people and produce something useful, right? So start increasing our GDP, incre increasing standard of living, right? And so these people will stop starving. So they will stop having babies. They will be better off. So they'll have even more babies. Their mortality will go down, right? We will, we are passing through charity hospitals to unlock char uh, right, charity hospitals. And then we're researching pharmaceuticals to actually move that up level. So all with the intent of increasing our population growth initially, right? That's kind of our strategy. And the reason for that, we want to improve our economy, increase our budget, afford a military and take on the Ottoman Empire and maybe the Austrian Empire. So there we are. There's only a couple of things we want to do before we unpause. And that's, let's go to the diplomatic lens quickly. And let's have a look what diplomatic actions can we actually take right and we can do improve relations and again we think we have 840 influence which is what we need to spend here i right? see the cost of uh, all actions is measured diplomatic actions is measured in influence we have 840 of it where do we get it from well we have 100 base 600 from being a minor power uh so it actually would be nice to cling on to that status with our prestige right and uh, not lose it then we have 20% from landowners. Again, we'll see what that is because they are happy with us. Uh, with the government, they give us a certain bonus. So we kind of work extra hard for the nation, regardless of whether they are in government or not. Uh, so we and we have uh, right. So we basically have lots of diplomacy. Let's go ahead and improve relations with Austria, given they can maybe side with us, uh, or maybe we can get sort of alliance, defensive pact with them, and we can fight the Ottomans together. Right. So that's kind of. The possibility there we can also if we are shut out from the ottoman market perhaps we can join a customs union with austria to access their market all right that's kind of our two options let's also improve relations with russia they could also help us fight the ottomans right and since we have uh 
the surplus of influence, which guys, for any of these three resources, which again, we'll talk about in detail later, there isn't actually very little benefit in having a, a, a in fact, there is no benefit for having a great surplus. There is some benefit, for example, here right now, we do have plus 10% infamy decay or any of these bureaucracy, we have plus 10% state construction efficiency, right? And that's because we're consuming 36, but we have a balance of plus 63. So as long as we have a balance of th plus 36 or above, we get no further benefit. But up from zero to plus 36, we get kind of an increasing benefit up to 10% state construction, right? That's what it says. Effects from 100% or more excess bureaucracy. Generation is higher than usage. Our usage is 36. We're at 63, which is 100% or more of 36. So we get this 10% state construction efficiency, which means we build things faster, which is nice. But we don't need, for example, we have 30. That's just completely wasted. In terms of influence, we're not really going to do any of diplomacy. So this infamy decay uh, bonus isn't terribly relevant either. So we can just go ahead and spend all of it. And we can you know, improve relations with Wallachia as well. So that's it. We're at plus 90, plus 3% infamy decay. Doesn't really change anything. As long as we don't get into a deficit, uh, we're fine. So we'll improve relations with these guys again, hopefully helping us to further our aim of gaining independence and uniting the Serbian people. Now, Orthodox Church, again, we'll talk about this when we unpause as to why they're now happy with us, but they have turned happy. Uh, but quickly, I will say it's because we're enacting a law that they are in favor. So there is a temporary benefit and a long term benefit. The temporary benefits, they're really happy with us. Now, the only other thing that we'll do before we unpause is have a think about trade, right? Now, in terms of trade, you know, so can we, do we need to import anything? Not really, right? We have everything we need, but we're not really producing anything. Now, can we export anything? We could export our wheat, uh, right, potentially, but do we really want to raise the price of our wheat given our pops eat it and we maybe need it ourselves and it's not that much cheaper than anywhere else? Not really, right? Livestock ranches, okay, our meat and fabric, maybe we could export it, but we'll soon be using it in our economy anyway. Wine, however, we have vineyards, right? So we could, in fact, we are 75% uh, below base price, and that is the minimum you can have. Prices range from minus 75% of base price to plus 75. Again, we'll talk about all of that in more detail. So could we help our wine, right? Because you can see it's in Northern Serbia, we produce 20. We consume only one locally. In the Ottoman Empire, there is a we're selling 100. But, uh, so someone else is also, some other provinces are producing it. But uh, the buyout is only 20, right? And that's because most Muslims probably don't even drink alcohol. Even the religion makes this a taboo good. But uh, there's probably some other minorities, like the Serbs perhaps even living in our homelands. They do drink some uh, wine, but it's not a lot. So can we go ahead and export, right? Can we export? And we click here and it shows us that, yes, you know, we can. Where can we export to? We can export to Austrian market would be amount of 50. Uh, and we could say, you see here. So we predicted it would be a level four trade route myself to Russia. Uh, predicted units of one export, it would be 35. We get revenue, a little bit of revenue, which is good, right? It's not very stable revenue, but it, you know it's still good. Predicted price impact on wine on Russian market, we would lower the price. We would be exporting to them, right? Predicted price on uh, from fifty seven to forty five, effectively. And predicted price impact on wine in Ottoman market, which is really what's important for us. We'll go from twelve and a half to nineteen point eight. That means this building will become more profitable, pay more wages, and pay more. Well, pay, maybe pay more wages actually but they're not competing for labor right now. So actually what they would do is pay more profits to the aristocrats that own them, making them wealthier, making the landowners more powerful. But nevertheless, you know, it's probably a good thing, right? Now we could also export to Austria and there the predicted level will be five. We would export 50, right? And that would be predicted price on wine in the Austrian market. It would go down from 69 to 60. Predicted price on wine in the Ottoman market will go from 12 and a half to 34. So let's establish a uh, trade route to Austria, All right? That should help our our vineyards. Now, we another thing we can do is in terms of tariffs. Right now, we're imposing a five percent tariffs on exports, and that's what generates that little bit of revenue. We don't really need it. We're running a massive surplus, 
So we could just go ahead and say, let's do export focus. So that means we have a massive tax on imports and so no one will be exporting wine to us, but we will reduce that, remove that 5% sort of export tax, making our wine even cheaper. And uh, in fact, we can go ahead and leave it here, actually make a little bit of money. It doesn't make that much difference, but we could if we wanted to, right? But let's see, and we'll see what actually happens when we establish this trade route, because there's a number of things that will happen other than uh, improving uh, the price of our, uh, the, the, the price of wine in our market or for our vineyards. Now, there we are. Let's say we set up that trade route and I think we are ready to unpause. Let me just think for a second. In fact, one more thing, right? Let's have a look at our budget, right? We're massive, running a massive surplus, right? Do we need the surplus? Not really. So what could we do right, right now? not spending money. We don't have any government buildings. We're not going to build any more military. So we're not going to be spending on anything. We don't have any subsidies. We're not subsidizing any industry. We're not paying any welfare payments, anything. So we could reduce taxes, right? Why not? What that would do is it would reduce the poll tax to 0 0.4, right? What that would do in turn, it would also reduce income tax. Uh, it would give us plus 10 legitimacy to our government. So everyone loves government that, you know, that uh, sets taxes to very low. Right, we'll get minus 20% radicals from standard of living decreases. So if we do, uh, if there's pops falling, shouldn't be happening right now, but we'd have fewer radicals, which we'll talk about again in more details as to who they are and what they do. But most importantly, we would reduce land tax on our pops, especially our lower strata pops, because it's a flat tax of 0 0.7 on everyone. Right, so we can see here, we go population tab. This is for our nation. We're a one state nation. So this pretty much covers just Northern Serbia. We'll look at our lower strata. We can see taxes. They pay 14% of their income in poll taxes, right? As opposed to uh, the middle strata, upper strata actually only pay income taxes. Uh, I think they will actually start paying poll taxes as well in a second once we unpause. Pay 14%. Yeah, that's quite a lot. So if we reduced, if we reduced uh, taxes to very low, right? We would reduce poll taxes at least for now, right? Uh, let's see if that actually changes straight away. Well, it will change when we unpause. What it would do is put more money in their pockets, improve their standard of living, perhaps even of those who are starving, right? So let them starve less. It would also, as we improve their standard of living, again, reduce their birth rate, reduce their mortality, but the differential will improve. It will again help our uh, population growth rate, right? And that's kind of what we're going to focus in the first, in the opening of the game building up our economy, employing these people and maximizing our growth rate as that will hopefully in the future lead to uh, a bigger labor pool, allowing us to grow our economy, allowing us to uh, uh, raise more soldiers and allowing us to have a stronger budget surplus to actually pay for those soldiers. So here we are. Now we've uh, come up on the hour and we haven't unpaused yet and I've gone through a whole ton. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. I will end this episode here just to keep them all at about an hour's length. But uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. I hope to see you in the next episode where we will unpause pretty much straight away and then continue to go over all of the mechanics, how they work and you know how our society changes as we build up our economy. Um, but for now, I guess if you enjoyed it, please give it a like, subscribe if you want to you know, be notified of, I guess, future episodes of this series but uh, do give it a like if you at least enjoyed it and found it useful in any way as you know the first episode of the series it really helps a lot to uh, get it out there and yeah hopefully you know help more people but thanks a lot for watching guys uh and yeah really excited to see you in the next episode um yeah bye